number six, the law of evaluating the pain caused by your boundaries. There is a real, real misconception about understanding the, the purpose and the, the place of pain and boundary setting and boundary keeping. I can remember one person who was very, very afraid of allowing her 21-year-old son to go to jail because all he'd done was to be possession, in possession of cocaine for the fourth time. And she said, what am I supposed to do? I love him. And she did. I mean, she, her mom really loved her son. She you know, still did his laundry. You know she loved him. <laughs> and she said, you know, he got caught again. He's busted, and this time he's going down. I mean, we we're talking about a, a few months, not sort of like overnight in the county jail and then out. He was going to do some time. And she said, he's come to me saying, if you will get the attorney and do the right things, people are telling me I can get off of this if you'll just put up a certain amount of money. And I don't have that much. I'm close to retirement age, but can you do this? And what I, in fact, I was at a seminar when this was happening, and I asked the crowd, which was a sort of a, a boundary positive crowd, and I said, what do you guys think? And a guy raised his hand at the end, very the part of the back, he said, um, can I say something to you, to the lady? I said, sure. He said, I was just like your son eight years ago, and I had a mother just like you. And I went down for the fourth time, and for the first time in her life, she said, I'm not going to bail you out. You're doing the time. And I told her she hated me, and I told her that I, you, she was a bad mother, and that if she really loved me and all this stuff, and I was scared, and I went and did time. And in that jail, I met Jesus Christ because somebody brought him to me, and I began learning that I was responsible for my behavior. And I've come out, my life is different. It was a hard time in there. Not, I, I became a Christian, but I did a lot of suffering too. But I learned that I need to carry my own weight. I need to decide what I'm going to do about jobs. I need to, to get in my recovery about cocaine. And he said, ma'am, if you love your son, you'll let him go do the time. Well, that's what this is all about. Lots of us have a real, real misunderstanding about the difference between hurt and harm hurt and harm, and we see them as the same thing. That if someone experiences pain because I don't rescue them, that I am harming them. And the problem is they're very, very, very different dynamics, and we need to understand that. Hurt does not equal harm. Hurt does not equal injury. In fact, without pain, there is no what? Gain. Hebrews 11 and 12 says that all discipline for the now, all reproof for now, feels like punishment. But God does it for our good, that we may learn. You know, why, why is pain good in learning to grow? Because you start learning what causes more pain, and you stop doing it. You're late to work, and you get a demotion, and then you don't have enough money to go on a vacation that year. And the next year comes around, and you think, maybe I shouldn't be late. Or you're unkind to someone that you love a lot, and then they leave you. And you learn, maybe my being unkind has something to do with the reason that people leave me. Pain teaches us something. It's a teacher. It's a healer. And... When we set limits with someone, we don't have what they want at the time and tell them no. They feel bad. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are being harmed, even if they tell you that. See, the only way we can determine that is the responsibility question. If you've got little children and they belong to you and they're, you're responsible for them, there are some no's like the withdrawal of love, withdrawal of comfort, withdrawal of food, withdrawal of safety that can really injure them. But if that person's 37 years old and still saying, if you don't do my laundry and don't pay my bills, you're hurting me, that's inappropriate. So number one, we need to make a distinction between hurting someone and harming someone. Number two, when we allow someone to experience pain, we help them see the hurt is due to their character structure, not you. The hurt is due to their personality problem, not you. The hurt is due to the fact that they're dependent on other people to bail them out, not who? Me. See, when a person can't live with boundaries, what they will do is they will make the other person bad and say, if you would only lend me the money, I'd be out of trouble now. Or, if you'd only spend more time doing, living life my way, then I'd be a better person. Where do they see the problem? Do they see they have a personality problem or do they see they have a bad other problem? 
How many of you have been professional bad others for many years? And so you sort of bend around this way and say, I'll try to do it this way, and you sort of become a pretzel, spiritually speaking, until you're kind of in the relationship like this, trying to love them right so they won't be unhappy. And the demand gets more omnipotent and more grandiose, and they need more and more and more because they're not understanding the pain of having to be responsible for themselves. When they finally see the reason I hurt is because I'm beating my head against a, a brick wall, which is Susie's boundaries, then they'll take a Kleenex and wipe the blood off and go somewhere else. Number three, expect anger and guilt messages from others. Expect anger and guilt messages from others. That's how you're going to determine the character qualities of the people you're around. Proverbs says, don't reprove a, a fool. He'll hate you. Just say it two, two, two or three times like Matthew 18 says and then let him have the consequences. A wise man doesn't hate you for saying no. A wise man will thank you, says the Scriptures. And you will find out that when you get lots of anger messages and guilt messages and I thought you cared messages and now I'm going to suck my thumb until I fall down and turn blue messages, you're not dealing with a wise person. You're dealing with a fool. Finally, as others stay with me in my no, there's more love. Love increases because the person says, it hurt me that you said no, but I understand. And you say that to them. And it hurt me when you couldn't be around last week, but I understand. And I don't like it, but the love begins to multiply. The best relationships in the world are those when we hurt each other by our no, but we stay connected because we give the other person the grace to have it. Your best relationship in your life will be one where you move closer and they move closer, expecting and respecting each other's no. Learn to love it in them, and when, you f when they feel the pain of it, realize you're not the bad one. When you hear from them, they're not the bad one. Harm and hurt are not the same thing. Okay, the next one. The law of proactive versus reactive boundaries. Have you ever known anybody who carries a sign around that says, I have the right to... Have you heard that? And especially nowadays in the Christian world, as, as counseling is kind of there, and we're finding out, yeah, you know, somebody hurt me and all this, and, and I'm a victim, which is all very important, right? That I've been hurt in some way, and they hurt me. But if I don't take responsibility and ownership of my life and I am defined by what they did to me, then they still own me. And there's a difference in being victimized and becoming a victim as an identity. See, a victimization or a hurt or a control or a bad relationship growing up or a divorce or something else, those are things that happen to me and they are part of my life. They're a significant part of my life. They have done, done all sorts of, of, of things in my soul. I'm not devaluing that. But when what I begin to be defined by, ordered by, directed by, is what someone else did or is doing to me now, then I am a reactive person and I am not in control of myself. Now what does that mean? It means that I basically can walk through life and that I choose how I am going to respond to whatever situation. It means that I am not determined by something other than my, my free will. What does that look like? Do you know anyone that you can absolutely, you would be willing to bet your car that you can get a reaction out of them? <laughs> you know, all you've got to do, like, let's take all of you obsessive compulsives out there. I'm going to get you. Okay? I'm going to get you. What I'm going to do <laughs> is I'm going to talk to you for a little while. And I want you to really listen to, because what I, you know, we've been building up to the real stuff and it's coming right now. And if you miss 
this next piece of content, your history. Now the question is, as we're talking about what the scripture says about your being in control and how your relationships are affecting you and who's causing you to react, how are you doing? <laughs> See? Can I do something totally irrelevant to you and you start to lose control of your life? Because you're how many of you want to reach out and fix this? <laughs> huh? You know that you've got some, some relative that if you went to their house for dinner and just before you sat down, just reached up and moved that picture a little bit, on the wall, that all through dinner they would be... <laughs> and see, what that says is that it, in some way, they're, how they're going to respond to life, the choices they're going to make, are going to be dictated from the outside. That's the definition of a victim. Now, it's good to have boundaries, you know, I'll give you a gift because you're so sick that you're going to miss the rest of this. Um, it's good to have boundaries, but a lot of people have the reactive boundaries of a toddler for life, and they call that recovery. See, people who have boundaries, you never hear them saying, I have the right to be angry. I have the right to make this choice. And, 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 and carrying this sign and sounding like a... a a political spiritual rabbit or something. I don't know what that is, but something, you know, other than, than, than a real person. And they're demanding, rea because they're reacting. And we, we probably have to go through a stage like that, where we're, we're like a two-year-old and we're reacting. But if we get stuck there, then we can become perpetually ordered and dictated from the outside. And people can send us wherever they want just by saying the right thing. The question is, am I free to do things based on my motivation and not somebody else's messages? I remember working with a couple one time, and he was wanting her to do something and was, was like full of guilt and anger and all of this stuff. And she was growing, and she turned to him and said, you know what? I'm going to do this because I think it's right and I think it will help. And I'm, but I'm not doing it because you are screaming at me or because you're manipulative or whatever. I'm doing it for these reasons. See, that was somebody who was free to love. If she were a reactive person, she would have to say, well, you can't manipulate me into that. And she could lay down and sacrifice the bad motivation and grasp the good. And we can't ever really go to the cross as we need to go to the cross if our behavior is determined by guilt or others or if I have to stand against it. Because then I can't love evil people. See, if I've got to have these reactive boundaries where anytime somebody less than perfect comes and does some sort of trip on me, I have to stand up for my rights. I'll never be able to love a sinner because every interaction that I'm going to have, they're going to be like me. They are imperfect. And I will never be able to do what Proverbs says, which is to cover a trespass and let it go. I've got to bring up every, every single infraction. And life becomes a series and relationships become a series of processing everything that you're not doing to me perfectly because now I have boundaries. See? Boundaries create freedom and the ability to respond in love, not the, the, the mandate to stand up for my rights all the time. And the question is, that's really good. We need to carve out that space and probably go through a period where we're not allowing anybody in our yard. But then we get secure enough and we need to be asking ourselves, am I getting secure enough? So when somebody does step in my yard, if I want to do something else, like, like continue to, to nap, I don't have to go get up and show them that they can't do that to me. Because I don't have an old agenda that's still at work. Freedom says that you can nail me to a tree and I might be free enough to pray for you. That's what Jesus did. And that's the ultimate goal of boundaries, to be responders to evil, not reactors. Reactors operate according to what the, 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 the scriptures call the talionic law, that, that I will retaliate an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And I need to have the power to do that so I can have the power to give it up. And that's when we move to love.
Number eight, the law of envy. Envy is one of the greatest boundary destructors that we can have. And the problem with it is it's generally not a choice for you and me. Envy is a problem of being in the family of man. It started with Satan. Envy is defined as seeing the good as that which I do not have. Whatever is good is what I don't have. In other words, if I tend to be a sensitive person who doesn't like um, kind of being really active in things, then I will see people who are very active and sports-minded, this sort of thing, as the people who have the good if I just had that and will devalue what we have. Or if I'm the sort of person that uh, tends to be more introspective, then I'll see the good as being more aggressive. Now, there's a problem with envy in that it is a bottomless pit. It is never filled. Have you ever been around a person that suffers from real severe envy and tried to fill up the hole? Some of us make us a career out of that. And you start realizing you're, you're, you're pouring teacups down the Grand Canyon. I remember one time, a long time ago, when I was in seminary, I, there was a fellow that was like, I didn't realize it, I just thought he needed me because I was a codependent Christian. And, and so I would spend hours with this guy. And the way I noticed that I was really, really in, with an envious person was one night I spent like four hours. I like flunked an exam the last day and everything because I, I was spending time with this fellow. And after four hours of counseling and encouragement and everything, I said, I, I need to go and get some sleep. He said, yeah, you've got to leave me like everybody else does, don't you? And I thought, you know, I could have taken that abuse with 20 minutes. <laughs> he was no better after four hours than he was after 20 minutes. That's what the envy does. It's, the good is always outside of me. And so there's never enough. Whatever comes inside is never good. It, by definition, becomes bad, and the outside is always the good thing. Now, we've got that. And there's two kinds of people in the world. There are people that own their envy, and there are people that deny it. And that's really how life breaks down. If you're with people that say, yeah, I've got a part to me that does that, I need help with that, then you will make great strides in learning the opposite of that, which the Scriptures call a position of gratitude. Gratitude. Romans 6 says we become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which we've been committed. Gratitude says, what I've got is good. Thank you. It helped. Thank you. I metabolized it. I knew you only had 20 minutes. I knew you only had a smile. I knew you only had uh, given me a ride once a day instead of once, you know, five times a day. But thank you. And when we start to see that, then those of us that can say, I am envious and I want to repent of that and learn gratitude will get full. The other people say, I'm not envious, they're the problem. I'm not envious, others don't love me right. I'm not envious, they don't understand, they don't care. And that is a spiritual disease that will send a person to hell. Happiness is not having what we want. It's wanting what we have. It's not having what we want, it's wanting what we have. What does it have to do with boundaries? It has a lot to do with the boundaries because we will resent the boundaries of other people if we envy. We'll make them bad because there's something outside of us they have we want. And if we can rejoice in that and say, you've got more money, you've got more love, you've got more time, you've got all these things that I would like, I'm happy for you and I want more, but you're not bad, we give up the envy and we move to gratitude. Biblically speaking, that is the position of love we need to be at is gratitude. Let me give you a few guidelines about learning gratitude from envy. Number one, we need to grieve what we cannot have. We need to grieve what we cannot have. What's your wish? Some of us have a great rescue fantasy that the white knight's going to come along, or the white duchess, you know, pick us up and take us on the Amtrak to San Diego and have this great life. And life is going to be a failure if he or she doesn't come along. Well, we need to start grieving that and say, it's sad, that probably won't happen. Life is going to be painful. There's going to be a lot of disappointment. But that's the way it is until the Lord comes back. We'll grieve what we can't have. Number two, we need to be, be able to look inward and take responsibility for our misery. Ugh. You're telling me, I come to this boundary seminar and you're telling me that I have something to do with my misery? Yeah. We all inherited character structures and genetics and crazy families 
But in our 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, and maybe in some other years, we have a lot to do with our misery. How am I staying isolated? How am I not taking in good things? How am I living a life of envy? Rather than, gosh, if other people would really see me for who I was, I'd be better. Look inward and say, it's my problem. My recovery, my sanctification, my getting well, my work in the depression is my task. The number three, we need to actively seek what we can have and appreciate it. Actively seek what we can have and appreciate it. You know what's funny? That whole third world, first world stuff, I, I read about that a lot, got a lot of missions interest. And we'll find people that, like, had nothing but, but except a lot of love in the early days. And they'll grow up and, you know, you'll give them an extra, you know, you'll take your extra five or six shirts you've got and you give to the organization. And they'll say, oh, we can give these to somebody else. So, no, that's for you. Oh, no, I know somebody's a lot worse off than me because they're not envious. And then in Orange County, you know, people that are making, you know, 800000 a year. And just like John Rockefeller, somebody said, how much money is enough? You might, what he told the reporter? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. He was worth about $2.5 billion then. Envy will never be satisfied by getting things in. Gratitude will make a good thing and multiply love from very humble origins. I know grateful people who are millionaires. I know envious people who are poor. And I know the opposite, too. And the only difference is those who own it and see it and those who make somebody else the problem. Well, it gets worse. <laughs> you know the really, really disappointing thing about boundaries recovery? is when we don't have boundaries and everybody annihilates us and we find out a lot of my pain is because of what others did to me and we think we're going to go get a sympathetic ear from a therapist or a 12-step group or the Bible. It says, yeah, I know. Kind of rough, huh? What are you going to do about it? It's the law of activity. And it kind of goes like this. I have a problem. What am I going to do? I possess a problem. What am I going to do? See, boundaries again are about ownership. And it's mine. Where's the problem? It's in my soul. Did I cause it? Probably not. A lot of the times. Sometimes. If you were, were victimized as a child, certainly you didn't cause that. But whose soul does the depression or the emptiness reside in? Who has it? And that's what, that's what ownership is about. If I'm victimized, I have the damage. Whose problem is it? Is it my fault? No, probably not. But whose responsibility is it? mine. Why? Because it's part of my soul. And I'm the only one that has control over submitting my soul to a process of healing. Activity says I am going to do something. I'm going to do whatever I am able to do and what I'm unable to do, I'm going to own that as well and take it to God and try to get enabled and empowered by Him. If you walk out of here today and a drunk driver hits you, and you're lying in the middle of the road with a broken leg, whose fault is it? His, or hers, or theirs. Chances are they're not going to come back and fix that. Even if they wanted to come back and fix it, they can't. Because the damage has been done, and the damage is on the inside, and I might can get help from the outside, which I need, but guess who has to go to that stinking physical therapy and move that muscle and build it back up? Moi. See, that's the hard part about the spiritual life. 
that we receive and the receiving of grace empowers us to do our work. And that's what the law of activity says. That whatever I find on my property, I have to take ownership for and I've got to begin to exercise those muscles. And I can learn about boundaries and I can learn that somebody else is doing something to me. But guess who has to take the hard step of exercising the no muscle? I do. I've heard that if you take a little birdie and, and he's ready to hatch and like the day of, that it's time for him to hatch, and if you break the egg and take him out and, and, and try to usher him into the world, that he can't survive. And the reason is that the, his pecking his way out of the shell builds his strength and his neurology and his muscles and all of that development so he can survive on the outside world. And if mommy does that for him, he's going to die. And that's what God does for us. He puts us in a nest where we begin to get the grace that empowers us to do our part. But it's got to be active on our part. And we don't get better if we're not doing our part of seizing the kingdom of God and fighting the battles. See, there are a lot of Christians out there today that are giving you something that, that sounds spiritual and it's not, and it's this. Just realize your position in Christ and you'll be well. Have you heard that? Just memorize that you're seated in the heavenlies. And memorize all of your spiritual blessings. And if you do that, then somehow your depression or your eating disorder has no dominion in your life. See, God has secured a position for you, and you need to memorize your position in Christ. There's nothing more unbiblical than that. Look at the children of Israel. God secured the land, but who had to go possess it? Who had to fight the battles? And through obedience, even though he was a son, he learned, or, or through suffering, he learned obedience. Jesus himself had to do the active work of going to the cross. They're right. God has secured a position for us, but we have to possess it. We have to seek it. We have to grind it out day to day. We have to take the risks. We have to go do things that you never thought you could do, like walk on water, Peter found out. And sometimes you're going to get wet in the middle of it. But we have to do it. And it's an active hungering and thirsting. I've got a friend who is a recovered alcoholic. And he's been dry for like 23 years. And I'll never forget this. We were playing golf one day. And I'll call him Sam. I said, Sam, you know, you were a, a hopeless drunk, right? And he goes, yeah, I was more than hopeless. I lost two companies and two marriages. I said, how did you get sober? He said, oh, it wasn't hard. I went to seven meetings a day. I like whiffed it and looked up and said, what? He goes, yeah, seven meetings a day. I said, for how long? He said, quite a while. I said, seven a day? He goes, yeah, because all I could do, you know, if I could make it to the next meeting without getting drunk, that's about what my need was. Now, that is what the Bible calls hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That's an active, that's somebody that you can't keep them away from, from their recovery. They're not going to blame the fact that the meeting is too far away. When they see the kingdom of heaven, they are going to take everything they own and sell it so they can purchase that coin. And that's what the Bible says. And the work of the soul and the work of all of this recovery stuff is not so I can sit on my can and just, you know, float on a cloud in heaven. No, it's work, and it's hard work. And if you talk to anybody in recovery, you know that it has to do with an active hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So when I draw my boundaries and I take an inventory and I find out what's lacking on my property, I've got to be active about doing my part to get better. Number 10, the law of exposure. Law of exposure. I want Tell you about one of my favorite people who was doing uh, some work on a real troublesome marriage. And she was just Susie compliant. I mean, she was the Christian doormat of all time. I mean, the guy had it, he had the life of Riley. I mean, as long as she stayed that way, he never had to feel any pain. I mean, she would pop up with a Diet Pepsi for him so he could hold it better while he's watching TV, this kind of a thing. I mean, it was great. I mean, she knew exactly how long to microwave, microwave the popcorn. She was a loving wife, what can I say? 
And finally, she started feeling the resentment about this sort of thing, and, and started, I started talking to her about the biblical idea of he's lazy and you're doing too much. And, and <laughs> that gave her some freedom to feel what she needed to feel. And she came in and she said, um, I finally did it. And I said, well, what did you do? She says, I finally set a lemon on Fred. Fred Riley, Life of Riley. And I said, well, what did you do? I was all excited. She says, well, he was sitting there and I was doing dishes and he t told me to, while he's watching television, to go get him some microwave and a Diet Pepsi. And I said, so what did you do? She says, well, I went and I got him. <laughs> and I brought him over there and I said, yeah, and then what would you do? And she said, well, usually I say, here you go, honey, and I give him a peck on the cheek. I said, you did something different. She said, yeah, I put him down and I just looked at him. So I call up the parade people and I tell them, we need a parade over here. <laughs> we have a victory. And I said, okay, do you mind if I check something out? She said, what? I said, let me find out how this boundary really, really affected Fred. <laughs> I said, fine, I was seeing him uh, in, the, in the marital session later that week and he came in. I said, so, you know, Susie was really different with you. And he said, he kind of burped because a lot of Diet Pepsi makes you burp. <laughs> He said, what do you mean? And she's in there, and, and he's, he said, no. She said, well, don't you remember Wednesday night? I came over, and I brought the Pepsi, and I brought, I brought the, the microwave, and I just looked at you. And he said, the microwave popcorn was a little bit burnt that night, as I remember. <laughs> What's the moral of the story? <laughs> Somebody said, yeah, what is the moral? <laughs> moral of the story is, it's not enough to have boundaries inside. Some of you that have never had them finally are feeling the, the anger and feeling the desire to set them, but you are not taking the responsibility to make them visible and communicated to the other person. And an internal boundary is no good if it's not com communicated to the other person. That is what the larger exposure is, is because there's a principle in the Bible about bringing things to the light. It's where healing comes from. The light is relationship. The scriptures don't talk about good and bad as much as they talk about light and darkness. We can't blame Fred for being selfish, right? He's going to stay in that narcissistic orbit until somebody comes in with a jackhammer and goes, boom, there's somebody else out here. <laughs> Other people have needs in this relationship, but somebody needs to remind him. And Susie needs to move away from that sort of, I just glared at him, I, you know, he could just see by my look and say, I need to bring this to him, and that's my responsibility to make sure he understands clearly, from now on, jerk face, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. You know how you can tell if you have a hard time with the law of exposure? Number one is if you find yourself grumbling a lot. If you grumble. In other words, the no is like subliminal, and the other person saying, well, they're, you know, they're trying to they're just, they're nice people. They're just trying to have their popcorn and Diet Pepsi. And they're saying, well, is something wrong? No, 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 nothing's wrong. <laughs> so if you grumble, so they can hear it or so they can't hear it, but if there's the internal conversation of resentment. Number two, if there are explosions. If your explosions are coming, it's probably because you've said yes and yes and yes and haven't taken a lot of time to clearly say what the limit is. From now on, in my marriage with you, I don't have sex until I know that you're going to talk to me for five or ten minutes. What? You demanding person? <laughs> yeah, I'm demanding. Are we going to talk or not? I had a guy in the office that was talking about that. He said, well, I don't see why she doesn't, you know, get more turned on by me. And I said, well, what's your marriage like? And I said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, what's your intimacy like? He said, well, I don't have it. I want more. I said, no, I didn't mean the sex. I said, the intimacy. He said, you mean that talking stuff? She wasn't doing the law of exposure with him. Number one is grumbling, number two is explosions, and number three is victimization. People re-victimize themselves who have good boundaries, but they're not taking the responsibility of saying, when you yell, I leave from now on. When you don't do your end of things, I withhold the paycheck. When you don't do what you say you're going to do, then I will be, you know, taking care of myself at a support group meeting three times a week and you won't have me to abuse. See, people that don't make their boundaries exposed to the light don't have the other person responding to them. The second thing about that is, if they're not exposed, then God can't heal them. 
See, it's only in the context of a relationship that boundaries get stronger, they get more firm, they get, they get more, more healthy. Because then you can work with them, the other can work with them, your support group, your Bible study, your church, your marriage can work with them, and you can talk about them. That's why people that have good supportive relationships are always talking about, do I need to set a limit here? I think I do. What about this? And they negotiate it. But people that don't have one either stay in a victim position or explode later.